last time on this kind of attempt to do something sort of empirical, though it got less empirical as we went on because I stopped keeping track of stuff, we looked at positions after this capture of a starter, a side capture of a starter, which as I said at the start, I think is in general one of the weakest ways to meet a center starter. And we looked at two different J options. We looked at this J option and this J option. And uh, I concluded a few things, but again, they should all be pretty tentatively held. One was that in general, the first turn player should look to play weaker cards when playing the J rather than stronger ones. Stronger gives the opponent much more options to slide. When I say slide, I mean play next to without capturing with the point that if you take it, they have potential to combo back. Now here there's a combo back, you know, uh, that the, the game's not necessarily over. The fact that this card has this square is uh, really important here. But, but the idea of sliding is to go somewhere next to something where they're not going to, I mean, they're not going to play six, right? If they play six, they're just giving you lots of squares to lock in. And so if they do take it, you have this way to combo back. Uh, similarly, you can go for four. And if they take it, you have this way to combo back. Sorry, in six, not four. So sliding is a more available and more powerful tool the bigger numbers are facing out. And it's more powerful for two reasons. One is it's easier to slide, right? It's easier to have a lower number facing towards the card if the numbers are high. Two, if you have the combo, the higher number it is, the more likely it is that you combo without overpowering. For instance, imagine the blue player here had two Irvines. They could play here once and then play here the second time. They could slide here and then combo back here. But here, they risk being comboed back because they overpowered everything. So even if it all goes wrong and they do have good slides and they do have a combo, it's more likely their combo will involve overpowering the lower numbers you have facing out. Your 675A, you would be really happy if it was a 611A, right? That's really hard for them to ever flip without being susceptible to combos. Therefore, uh, things go well, and they're actually really unlikely to be able to slide there, right? Because you can't slide next to one. By really unlikely, I mean impossible. So there are two benefits lower numbers have that higher numbers do not. It's both that you deny some options to slide. It's just harder to have slides, right? The reason they need to have two Irvines to slide here is because only one of their cards can slide in four, and the fewer cards that is, the more likely it is that they don't have that and have a way to combo as well. Here they want this card for both squares, and they end up not having the card for either. So in general, one of the first of my conclusions in our first test was if you're looking for a J, the big combo setup J, the like synergy J. Now here our opponent has the combo in both squares. There are times when that's not the case. So we should again take this all with a grain of salt until we have more examples initially look stronger than the weak corner getting rid of a card you don't want J. Um, which does fit my prior assumptions, so I'm, I'm, I, I find it easy to believe, but that was one of our conclusions. Another conclusion was that the T and the Q tend to be stronger than the S and the Z, and if your cards fit decently there, you should prefer them to the S or the Z unless your cards are just perfect there. Or if it's close, you should lean going for the T or the Q than the S or the Z. Uh, that was our second conclusion. And our third conclusion was it is an underrated attempt to go for the what I call the MC corner rather than what I tend to call the Q corner. Now here, you'll notice red can take this corner and cannot take this corner. And it is more likely that they can take this corner because it interacts with more things. There are two cards it can play off as well as a wall. While if you play here, there's only one card it can play off in one wall and three is empty, so it can't play off that. So it's easier for the person to take seven. Also, they played the card in one and they may have in mind setting up against seven. So they just, there are just a lot more interactions with seven. It is more likely they can take seven. But in both of the situations we looked at, both cards in three, one and cards in three, um, the MC corner, uh, it didn't do better in both, but did about as well, despite the fact that in both instances, it could be captured and the move in nine or the move in the far corner, the Q corner, couldn't. And that was a kind of interesting effect. One thing to consider, 
is that the MC corner is underrated. In my more recent videos on close, I've considered this might be due to this very specific move order of center side corner, and it might not apply to center corner side. Uh, we will probably focus more on differentiations like that at some point later in the series. But I did want to consider one more move here that we didn't talk about at all, which is 6, 7, 5, A, and 2. This is not a J, so it's a little out of the purview, but we do have a question from first turn's perspective. So far, it seems, and again, very limited examples, that the weak corner is better than the strong corner when you're playing in one of these center starter met by a side positions. However, there is the question, what if the best option of all is just to go in a side? So what are some plausible options for our blue play? I think I'm going to say probably not one. Um, they can't capture two from one, and they can't combo two through to recapture one. Maybe there's some line where, you know, you go here, they go here, and you get them to flip five, and then you have a way to combo back five. But I'm going to just say, all right, let's not consider moves in one here. Let's consider a move in three. Probably a capture. I, I don't see much point in not capturing. So let's say move in three with a high number facing out. That's going to be one of our candidate moves. Uh, and another candidate move will be nine with a high number facing out. And another will be seven with a high number facing out. I know these two moves are very similar, but one is strong to eight and one is weak to eight. Slight differences. Okay, let's start with three. Now, if you're the second turn player, or the first turn player here, I think. In general, you should be trying to go for the T, but the 3799 is a pretty dead card. Pretty dead card. One nice benefit is this combo has a lot of potential. So actually, if you can get 9 kept open, this could be a really promising position out of kind of nowhere for you. I wish you could go here, setting up 7, 8, 8, 4, and 7 giving it both those squares, because they're unlikely to block 7 or 9 there. If you go here, they're, you know, probably going to play something in 1. And now if you could hit them with, like, a non-capture here, you'd have a big combo chain set up. But it doesn't seem that you can do something like that here. I think worth considering just the capture. And worth considering captures when you probably just put this here. And... Ah, the problem is that flip eight. You didn't want to flip eight. You don't really have a way to allow the chain, so this is pretty ugly. Um, yeah, the three seven nine nine is a really poor card here. You can also consider three seven nine nine and one. And on, for instance, a capture, but this is still really clunky because you have to flip eight when you don't want to. Take the combo immediately, but that's that's pretty unpleasant. This looks unpleasant. This is, there's a real dead card. So I guess the other option is just to go for some kind of S or Q, right? I think you do want to get rid of the 3799. Now it's a little up in the air. Because you're very unlikely in this position to block 6, um, that you didn't block 6 doesn't give them that much too, that much information. If you had six, maybe you're more likely to play in one, maybe, but one is so likely to be met by six uh, that it's kind of unclear. So I don't think they have obvious information. We can play this out a few ways. As I've said, you usually play corner side or side side. So let's check some possibilities there. Say they play this side. Well, that's a little annoying for us. We don't really have a way to deal well with that. And we're, we're probably just going to lose this game to something like this. Uh, here we get the combo, but, and here we also get the combo. So actually, I guess, I guess we just happen to hold here. Um, we do lose if they do it. Well, actually, sorry. Uh, the reason we don't hold here is because we almost certainly play this way so that we have two, but then we, or we have the capture, so we do lose. I don't know. I'm not sure how you're going to play that end game. Uh, probably a clear path, but it's it's hard for me to judge while seeing the cards. I think those are clearly unpleasant for the first turn player. Um, there's also them starting here, which is great for us. Um, probably
football game goes something like this. That's not really too hard. This one just does that, but that one seems unlikely. It's kind of scary to give up six. So there's either six, then four, or you can go four, then six, or you can go one, then six. So you can go one because even if I had the combo in six, you presumably have some play back, right? Like you can combo back through five to reflip the stuff. It didn't combo there, but the same stuff flips. So you're not too worried about that. Probably here. You have to block five with something. Probably the highest number phasing out, but it doesn't matter both ways. So this is all really unpleasant. So we're definitely, if they can go in three and be safe, this is pretty unpleasant for us. I forgot to mention four or six are possible here, but we'll come back to that. So this is really good for blue. Uh, second move we might consider is here. Uh, I do think the T is pretty solid looking, uh, just from our perspective without knowing what the other person has. We have two cards with decent down power to try to hit this end game. T's tend to be good. If they have the combo in four, you're not necessarily dead, and if they don't, you often have a really nice position. If they capture here, we probably recapture this way, and we happen not to win, but obviously it's pretty close. Uh, we actually would win if we had done it this way, unless they knew our hand and could play here, but they never play there. So some winning chances, but we probably do it this way just to make sure we're not vulnerable to combos. Almost certainly do it that way. They could also start by blocking six. And it doesn't really matter what they have facing out here. Say this. Do we take the combo? I think we go... If we go here, we can't lose. If we go here, we could lose to a combo chain, right? Now, we happen to, in this case, if we go here and they do the combo they have, we happen to combo back, but we don't know that. Um, so here is safer. Is there something more precise? We could also just go here, but that's, you know, we have some combo potential, but we can lose there, too. We probably end up going here. I guess that can lose if they can combo a three, which actually they can't. So, but uh, no, it can't because you have you combo back in three, right? So that one can't lose. So probably you end up playing this way, and probably the game ends up as a tie for you. All right, what else do we want to check briefly? There's this move. I, I think we we always go nine here if we can lock in and get a T and have some down-facing power. That's pretty pleasant. Uh, and this looks really bad for them, but let's play it out. This is a kind of nice capture, but we happen to have this to, uh, to do one. Oops, did I just reset the solver? It keeps clicking things. I don't mean it to. Uh, I think I just crashed the solver. I'm going to boot up another version of it. It might take a sec to load up because we're running the um, the recording. So what do we want to conclude there? We didn't check four or six. I think what I want to conclude is I'm not that interested in looking at lines right now, but uh, maybe they're not as dangerous as I thought for second turn. But it seems like from the three corners we looked at, two of them look really bad and one looks really good. And it really just comes down to, can you put out something they can't take? And whatever you put out has an interaction with the card in five and with the wall, and you just kind of have to happen to have something they can't hit. And if that's not the case, it seems pretty unpleasant. All right, let's input the card into the hand. Um, and let's move on to another reply to the starter in the series. Current, current best graphical iteration we have. I don't have a way to paste in all the numbers at once from my file, which is a little bit of a shame. Uh, yeah, select which Irvine we want. Just for a different tier, let's go Rebirth. How would I go Rebirth? I don't know. Can't 
do it. Nope, it's off screen. Alright, let's do this stuff. Uh, I can move it slightly. I'll move it slightly. Yeah, there we go. Alright, uh, red has first turn. All that's good. Alright, A5, 9, 7, and 5. And what we're going to look at more today is A4, 8, 6, and 6. Uh, this has some logic because 8, 7, 8, 6 has a recapture. And uh, 9, 3, 7, 9 is a recapture in the other square. It also captures the card in 5. Now, I think these moves are really high risk because you are flipping five with high numbers facing out, which means they're very susceptible to being comboed, and the combo chain can just kill you at the end. Here is a somewhat interesting example because red has neither square. This is pretty miserable for red. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily terrible. So let's try to figure out what's a plausible way we're going to only look at J's, not lines. What's a plausible way to go for the J? Well, I noticed the 7A84 means anything in 3 or 9 is covered. So we want to keep that in our hand for sure. The weakest corner we can play is here. So I think that's really worth considering. Not a card that has very much power facing anything, right? It's only possible capture on board is here. Now you might say 7A68 has no captures, but I kind of assume that's going to line up. Also, if we go here or here, there's always the question of do they go in 2 or 8, and 7, 8, 6, 8 controls those squares. We want to keep our side to side. It's going to be a side to side game. This seems our least relevant. So if we're looking weak corner, I think this is the instinctual move. If we're looking for a stronger corner, or specifically the move that sets up the most combo synergy for our hand, if we're trying to maximize that, then I think the move that comes to mind is here, setting up 3, 7, 9, 9, and 2, maybe 6, 7, A, 5, and 4. This is probably, I mean, we don't have a lot of combo play, but this is probably the most we have. So I would say those are the two main moves. One thing to note about weak corners is it also tends to get rid of the card that's worst for the rest of the game. Um, because a lot of the action is going to face away from wherever this is facing. So this can be useful in two ways. So I think those will be the two moves we're looking for. Let's start here. So we sort of came up with four key options. Slide in two, slide in four, MC corner in three, or the Q corner in nine. All right, let's see if we have options. Our only slide in two, we do not, uh, in four, we do not have the combo back in two. You could also consider high number facing out in four, but here, Anything with high number facing out in 4 is A, asking to be comboed, and B, continuing this combo chain that we don't have access to. We, the second turn player at this point, don't have access to on final turn. Uh, this seems kind of just terrible for me. So I'm not really going to consider that move. Uh, you might say we should play it out, and maybe there's some case for that, but I really hard for me to be all that interested. If it works, it seems to me it's based on being highly lucky. I, by the way, think they should take the T immediately. And even though 7A84 is a kind of poor card here, and like if we see perfect play, we can see that this is winning for second turn. But they have to start in three, and no one starts in three here. Um, this is a position where you play in two or eight. And uh, yeah, 3799 is going to prove a powerful card. Uh, I'm not too interested in that position. Okay, so then there's the question, can you slide in two, which requires you to have some kind of combo potential in four. You don't really have that either, and you don't really have a challenging move, right? The highest number you can stick out is like a six or a seven, and this is simply going to be taken, and you don't have the combo back. The end game might not be the worst thing in the world. Maybe they should take this way, because up power is useful because they happen to have no captures, because the red hand happens to have no ups. But this seems very heavily reliant on the opponent having a weirdly terrible hand, uh, which, you know. So I think we're left with three and nine as the most plausible moves. You, dear viewer, may have concluded something else, but let's look at those as our main moves. Let's start with nine. Now we have the question of, do we go for the S or the Q? I have advocated going for the Q, so let's start with that. Again, the solver says there are ties here. 
but I think in practice, this is going to be fairly difficult. The question is, do you start in 3, 7, 2, or 4? Of course, those are the only squares, but if you start in 3, you're planning to make your next move in 4. So for instance, 3 meant here, you got to have a good follow-up in 4. Here you do, you actually lose, but can't, they can't play it like that. Uh, they probably have to play it this way. Uh, but that actually loses. Both cards are terrible going up, so maybe they just capture and hope you can't combo back. They could go in 7 instead, but 3799 is terrible in one of those squares, so maybe this makes the most sense? This might be the most logical? Because if you go here, they at least tie. They happen to combo back there, um, but say they at least tie. And if you go here, uh, unless you can combo the 3799, they also at least tie. So that's probably the way a person would play this. Um, like this happens to win, but you, you can't know that. Uh, so three, I guess, is likely tie after this. And two, can you slide in two? You can. Again, it's funny that this combos and this doesn't against the eight facing down, because the most likely continuation is something like this, and actually blue wins. Uh, or sorry, red wins, but you're much more likely to play it this way, in which case blue wins. Right, would you rather be able to combo exactly an eight or a nine, a five, and a six? You're, you're going to go for the nine, five, and six. That's kind of goofy. Um, but this is to say, in these cues, sliding around five is really important, and red would much prefer not to have put the five when they locked in. Uh, is there something else you can do here? You could play this way as well here. Um, this does end up losing. We don't have a great card for three. Yeah, I think this probably is going to win for blue. And it's a good instinct when you have a good move in one square, sliding in the other. Again, if this was open, this doesn't work, but it's not open. So I think two is a good shot here. Um, there's no way to slide in four, so we can rule that out. You could also start in seven, but you have to use this card. Now it's a little scary to go in four because you might get comboed. So if they do call the bluff, they win. But if they don't call the bluff, what are they going to do? Here? And I guess you get some kind of tie. But given that this is very unappealing, because your 3799 is so dead in four, so bad in four, you probably do go for it and you happen to win. Weird endgame. I think this means blue red is never going in seven though because uh, blue is never going in seven because they don't want to go in two. So this one's just not happening. I think the way this is getting played in practice is probably either three or two. Um, two being the nicer option. Sliding around five is a really effective tool. Okay so that's the cue. There's also the, the S. Probably want to do it this way, right? That seems like it keeps the two better cards for this end game. Now, blue doesn't really have eight, and they also don't really have two here. So I think if they start one, this just is going to end up losing. Yes, technically there's a tie, but it's really hard to be able to take it. But you're, you're not playing like this, because your best shot is to have a six facing out. You're probably not playing that way. You start here? No, that's your only capture. You can't really start in two. This is just going to be a really unpleasant position, I think, for blue to play. Their up-down hand does not fit well here. Maybe you play a low number out and then the high number out, but that ends up being even worse in practice, but you don't know that. 
Yeah, this is, I mean, there, there's definitely, I mean, there's clearly ways to tie here, but it's going to be an unpleasant game. It's definitely first turn favored here. So this is an argument for the S over the Q, specifically when five is flipped and has high numbers facing out that are possible to slide down to. In our previous examples, it was harder to slide around five when comparing the S or the Q, but the best tool in the Q for the second turn player I think this will come up a lot, are sliding type options. They're not high number facing out options. It's going side and then side. And if you don't flip five, that option is removed and it can be a lot harder to play. So much of this is about who controls five and you really want it to not be you. Okay, uh, the other move I wanted to look at was three. Now three is covered, it's the MC corner. Note that uh, oops, oh, I did it again. I just keep accidentally, it keeps, um, I keep mistakenly, I guess, right-clicking. All right, I'll boot up another iteration of it. Sorry about that, this will take a sec to load. But there is the 3799 capture and two that both gets rid of a card you don't want and doesn't flip, which is to say every single time we've looked at the MC corner so far, it's been, that's not, let's flip that. It's been capturable, which is interesting. Um, it's gonna certainly start looking better if we ever see it when it can't be captured. As I've said, it is worth noting, it can be captured more than the far corner can, but still we've seen it at a kind of extraordinarily high rate be able to be captured in just how we've happened to line up this game. Let's do the Irvine Ivy first. All right, make sure we have all the rules, make sure it's red first. So uh, what are we looking at? 8, 4, 6, 8 here, uh, 7, 8, 6, 8, and we were looking at Irvine here. Oh, you can see my sleep thing come on. All right, so probably 3, 7, 9, 9, definitely keeping the up power of 7, 8, 8, 4, not being vulnerable to combo. And here there's the question of like blocking 9 or taking 4 immediately. Now here taking 4 immediately happens to be quite good. How would you play this? I guess you go here or here. Is there a good argument for one or the other? This will, if this is your sweeper, it has trouble hitting, it sets up a threat in eight, which note that if we start here, if we start here, we set up a threat in eight. If we start here, we do not. So that's some case for going here. They really have to block eight. Uh, this, if it lands, can combo an 8 or a 4 or a 5. This can combo a 4, a 5, or a 7. That's pretty similar. So you're probably going to start this one just because you have the chance at 8. They definitely should block 8. You would. Um, and if they happen to block this way, you win. But there's kind of no reason for them to put the low number facing out. It's somewhat similar likelihood to be comboed, and they're both strong to 5, so you're not avoiding combos. They, either way, they lose if they go seven. That's probably how you'd handle it. Definitely advantage first turn, but I'd say probably a tie. Uh, then there's this way of playing it, capture, which happens to tie here. Um, and you could play to lock in and use your sweeper, which wins you. That's probably how you should play. This gives them more captures and a bad sweeper. This, they'll never be able to capture enough to win. Even if they had a combo and eight, you're flipping four back no matter what. And you win unless they have exactly an eight facing out. So you're definitely going to play it this way. Almost certainly going to win. So better to play four than nine, I guess, here as the cards play out. But that's just because of the up weakness. Yeah, this time the MC corner looks pretty bad. but also there was just no synergy around it. Okay, don't know what to conclude there, but uh, I also would like to look at this move. Uh, so here, seven, eight, six, eight, and three actually ended up playing pretty well, but it's partially because there happened to be no slides. You made the odds of slides higher, but sometimes they don't have it. So they didn't have the options of two and four. 
the option in nine was okay. Um, and note that first turn is actually doing well here, even though they have no play against six, which is kind of remarkable uh, that first turn is doing as well as they are with just no fight against six. But again, that's partially because blue doesn't have good moves in two or four. If they did, three and nine would stay open longer. We're kind of only considering moves in three and nine, and those start to get rid of those squares, which is red's problem. So they're kind of getting lucky. And this move is similar, but doesn't incentivize two or four. And yeah, there's, there's no way to usefully, uh, it doesn't incentivize four or eight as the case is here. And there is, there's no way to slide here next to them. So I think we mostly can rule those out. We could consider this move. High numbers facing out, always worth considering. The combo chain happens to be untouchable for our red player, uh, which is just very unlucky for red. You will often find games with beginners beating strong players because they just keep playing these high numbers facing out where if the strong player had any combo potential at any point, they'd win and they just don't have the cards for it, and they just lose. And if you're... There, there is a case for occasionally just saying, my card doesn't click, I'm just going to say you don't have the combos. And you will usually lose playing that way, but you will sometimes win too. And if you think you have no equity other ways, maybe there's a case for it. Here is kind of remarkable. Probably play here. And just hope you have the sweepers. Maybe you do have the sweepers. There's also actually a case for playing it this way, which doesn't give up that much information because it's fine you locked in four. You're saying I have a combo chain somewhere. And I guess if they're the beginner, they just start to keep capturing. And here, I guess you win if they do it this way, and you tie if uh, you lose if they do it this way. And there is a case for doing it this way because it doesn't make the combo chain. But this is kind of uh, getting a bit silly. I think the, the, the standard option should be here. Given that they never have two, maybe they do go three. That's a little bit annoying because, oops, almost reloaded again, because you really don't want to use your seven, eight, eight, four here. Maybe you have to. But if you play it this way, uh, you just don't have combos back. If you had anything for nine, this would be great, but you just have nothing. So you might have to play it this way, but then you happen to completely blank at the end, which is just silly. Why, why do you keep thinking I'm pressing reload? Um, so some, some silly end games here. I don't think this is all that serious a line. What I'd like to do at some point is figure out, like, not quite a bot because I don't know how to quite make him do this, but some like some orders of operations, right? Say like we have a first turn player, we have two first turn players. We have a first turn player. They're, they're going to make the same move in five, and one will always follow up with the weak J, and one will follow up with like this more combo setting up strong J. And you have you test out, you take like ten hands, and you test out some different plays against them, right? So you have one player who always goes for the MC corner, you have one player who always goes for the far corner, you have one player who always slides or just plays in four, I guess, if the slide isn't available with a high number facing out or a low number facing out, you could do it different ways and just like run a lot of games and see which ends up performing the best. But you also need to figure out how they play the follow-up positions. And so it, it would just be really hard to automate and take a lot of thought. But it would be kind of interesting to do at some point. All right, can we do anything more here? Uh, yes, because we've barely done anything. We've just looked at uh, most players, I think, are in playing four or eight, three or nine. Uh, high number in three. Again, we have the choice between the, uh, the Q or the Z. In the Q, I guess we look for the slide first. We have combo potential in both eight and in five. But we have no way to slide in eight or and in four, and we can slide in four, so we should probably slide in four. Again, this is a really silly way of playing because if your opponent has nine, you just lose a hundred percent of the time playing this way. 
but uh, you do actually get a tie as this plays out. Uh, but again, if they ever had anything for nine, this is just playing to lose. Um, and then there's also playing the strong corner. So there's this way of doing it. Red happens to be really poorly placed for this one. There's also this way of doing it, which red also happens to be really poorly placed for. Uh, they're just terrible up down. Yeah, this is really unpleasant. So seeing that, even without knowing those cards, we should look at this position and be like, I have a terrible, I have nothing for, for one or four. And while I have okay play and eight and nine, it's not even that good because I could never flip anything above me. So okay, let's make the game entirely side to side. Probably means going here again. Uh, just because I, I, I like to have the threat in two. And now there's, again, a few ways for them to play it. They could start in one. I think here we do just go two. We flip so much there. Uh, we do end up losing that one. But do we have much other options? We don't have to set up here. So maybe you should play it like this. Keep these two sweepers. And now anything in one can be met here. And I think you win. I haven't counted it out, but it looks like a win to me. Uh, because you have the combo in both squares. Good job. Anything combo is three and up. Might have met that. Okay. Well, at least you don't lose there. Um, if they go one, if they go two, you know, they, they can't set up a combo chain, so they probably go high and you're in good shape here. If they go eight, they have nothing really good for eight. If they go nine, uh, you can flip anything that goes in nine. You're a little combo vulnerable if they have one. They happen not to here. You're pretty quick combo vulnerable, actually. You might get scared and go here. Uh, but even then, you're, you're doing fine. So I guess this is to say I was probably too high on the queue last time, and it really depends on what cards you have left. But you should be playing much more to what cards you have left than to, like, whether you want side to side or are comfortable with some of the board being up down, which leaves your cards more dead, which gives them more play. Also, you don't want to flip five if you can help it. Sliding is just such a powerful tool for second turn. And here, anything in two flips five, but things in four don't. All right, so we've seen a big argument for the S or the Z today. Um, there's also the MC corner, and continuing our, our everything we've looked at so far, it can be taken. So there's going here. This happens to be hit by this, but this happens not to lose. Um, happens to still tie, uh, because you have nice play in four. Uh, they should also consider going here, but this happens to uh, not work out. Because again, that combo potential through five is really scary. Yeah. So that looks pretty decent for second turn. They also have this move where you happen to have no downs at all. How do you play this? I guess you could go here and you're going to tie. Or you could start here and you'd end up losing. Are the two kind of plausible moves. But the MC corner looking pretty decent here. Um, We've really only seen one MC corner that did all that terribly out of four so far, which is pretty remarkable given that it's been taken all four times and often just locked in. All right, uh, I'm not sure what we got from this. I think, uh, what were my three conclusions last time, or my four conclusions? One is weak corner, sorry, a weak corner better than strong corner. Here in this second look, Might have done a little better with the strong corner, but it was because blue had like no play against it and actually had a little more play against this one. It actually set them up to have eight. Um, and that's pretty unlucky, but of course gonna happen some percentage of the time. Uh, also, this happened to give nice coverage to this specific move with 3799 having an alternate capture. Um, I still, I'm still thinking the weak conclusion corner is better. Uh, another conclusion was Q is better than S or Z. Today we saw all evidence for the S or Z being better. 
So I'd like to back off that conclusion and say really dependent on what cards you have. Um, for instance, in a right in these positions we didn't have the capture in six, but in what's an example where we do in this position. Whether we go for two or six really depends on which cards we want remaining, right? It really depends on whether we think this for here and this for here is better or worse than something like, oh, this is so good though. Oh no, it does flip five. I didn't want to flip five. Um, this is that combo. It's also, of course, flips five both directly and through the combo. But, um, you know, this for here and this for here. Which do we prefer? What kind of sweepers do we prefer? And then the other thing, one reason to go for the two immediately, is if you have a card that has the capture in nine, but you don't want to keep in your hand, you might want to go for it immediately. Like if you needed seven, eight, eight, four to capture this, for ten, three, seven, nine, nine wasn't here. Um, and so you had to keep it in your hand, but you didn't like seven, eight, eight, four in general over here then you might want to play it immediately because you don't want to keep it if it's going to play in three. Now here it's a perfectly decent card for three, so that wouldn't be a worry, but imagine it was really bad in three and good in six. There's a good case for taking that immediately. So there's, you know, lots of considerations there, but I shouldn't have been so quick to jump on Q is better than S or Z, uh, very dependent on what remaining directional strength you have, which you should pick. Uh, what else? Sliding is really good, not really testable on the ones we looked at today because there was very little opportunity to slide. We might also conclude second turn does better with these strong numbers facing out on the capture than weak numbers facing out. But even though we had these strong numbers facing out and first turn often kind of died at the end, it wasn't that often. I'm not sure second turn did all that much better even though they happen to stick out numbers first turn couldn't take, which is kind of remarkable that this... Now, of course, uh, first turn had a lot more play off the card in five than they did when we made the game up down. So it may have been that, like, you know, you look at first turn's hand, first turn's hand is much happier going side to side than up down. So it makes sense that first turn is more annoyed by seeing this move in eight than they are by a move in six. But... These are somewhat connected, right? Part of the reason, oh, I said right again, part of the reason that first turn doesn't have the captures is because they're a side to side hand that happens not to have like Sid or something that would have play in three. So part of the reason that they can't capture this is they're side to side. So part of the reason they're unhappy to see it correlates with reasons they are also happy to see. It. They don't aren't able to take it, but they are happy to see the game go side to side. So there's some trade-offs there. I'm not sure what I want to conclude today. I still like the T. I still think you want to, if you're the first turn player, look for the J. If you're the second turn player, I don't think you want to flip these cards in five. That second turn did well here, even when their card in six was completely safe. Sorry, that second turn didn't do that impressively even when this card in six was completely safe, is kind of remarkable. And if there was any play against this card in six, like second turn would have lost so many of these positions and had so little hope for a tie. So I am very skeptical of moves like this. I think we also saw repeatedly that you didn't want five to be your color. You want five to be the opponent's color. You want to have the option to slide, you want to have the opponent not to have the option to slide. Unless you just have no ways to flip five later, you usually want five to be your opponent. And so in general, these side moves looking to flip five, I think are not going to be the best second turn to do. And so what we're going to be looking at next, and I think I've been going a while, so I should stop. Yeah, I've been going 40 minutes. So we're going to stop here, is going to be matching sides, right? This is going to be, I did again doing it more, is going to be moves like here or here. Now, based on what we know, we would expect this move to do better just because we know first turn doesn't like going side to side, up and down, and they do like going side to side. Also, they do have some play against this. Um, 
but this is what I want to look at next time is are we going to see different results out of these moves that don't flip five, but they also don't set up slide potential. I mean, they're not sliding moves. And our instinct from what we've said so far is that we might prefer moves that slide that give us potential to combo back to moves that don't. But that is somewhat balanced by the fact that first turn is the more likely player to pull off the final combo. You sort of need one card's worth of sliding. And I guess one way to put this is, uh, I'm just going to put out weak numbers. If first turn can take at every point they want to, first and there are no combos, first turn will win a game of triple trial. Even if second turn can also take at every point, if first turn had this double capture at the end, they would win this game. If first turn takes at every point they want to and there's no combos, first turn wins. So second turn's path to not being losing is one of two things. Either they need to put out numbers high enough that first turn can't take it. That's option one. Um, there needs to be some moment in time when first turn can't take. Two, first turn has to go astray, right? For instance, if we play something like this, and first turn captures immediately. Now, second turn can capture back. Let's, again, just assume one capture at a time. Here, I don't have a way that doesn't combo, so let's say they go here, um, you know, something like this. This is first turn capturing at every point they wanted to, and even if they had a capture at the end, they would only tie because their move in two was bad. Now, you might say first turn would have won if they had comboed here, but we're saying without combo, and if they only flip one card here, this is the same structurally as going in three. So I wasn't cheating when I put them in three. I just didn't have a way to do a single capture in seven. Uh, and I don't have a different card I could put in four that gives a way to give a single capture. So I, I didn't have the cards to give an example. But my point here is uh, the move in two is a mistake from a structural point of view. So way one that first turn fails to win is second turn at some point plays something that first turn just can't capture. Uh, they actually can capture that. So let's say something like this, that first turn can't capture. They are forced to need to capture it. They're not able to do that capture, so they don't win. Second version is that doesn't happen, but first makes a structural mistake, and now second turn, even if first turn has a single capture at each opportunity, uh, second turn doesn't lose as long as they play structurally correctly. But the third way is combos. But you don't want those combo chains to go forever. Second turn can do well on a huge combo chain, but if first turn has that combo at the end, if there's some you know huge combo chain starting in six, if first turn can flip that at the end, they just win. And so second turn needs to be really careful about that, and they basically need to get one or two extra cards from it to either tie or win. And that's why a lot of these positions we've looked at are things where we get cues but a queue where there is potential to slide. And in those positions, here we see one high number out facing that first turn can't take. So that's one, that's enough that we can tie if we're structurally correct. But also potentially, if we could flip that extra card via combo, if we could flip through five to flip two, suddenly this would be uh, potentially winning instead of potentially tying, right? I did it again. So, Sort of for, for to go from first turn advantage to second turn, we need to think about can we place things first turn can't take, and can we set up these short term combos that favor it. This is to say, sliding against a starter makes a lot of sense, but matching can make sense too, because we know five didn't flip, and we need to put out challenging numbers for them, and we don't need the combo to hit that many extra cards. And in fact, if it does, then the combo chains are likely to be too big and hard to manage. And if we get hit back on them, we lose. We want the combo chains to be fairly short, but decisive. We need to flip that one or two extra cards, but we don't want it to be more because as soon as it's more, the combo chain is likely to have gotten out of hand. And even though this, you know, if it's flipped, like if we combo through five, Maybe they can't combo back, but if this chain starts extending, right, if we see something like this, 
then suddenly it by flips, everything starts flipping. The chains have gotten out of control. And by playing something like this, we potentially limit whether the chains get out of control. So I think there is a really big and open question, and I do not know what strong closed players consensus is. Maybe there is a consensus. I would suspect lots of players have opinions, but have kept them relatively private, uh, given that there's just not a lot of discussion. But I'd be really curious whether people think it is better to play matching sides or weak sides, or if it depends a lot on the hand and can go either way. Uh, but you probably have some preference, some lean here. You're likely to have more moves that slide, right? If we just look at this hand, right? Slide, slide, overpower, overpower. So if we're saying overpowering is bad, that's two moves out, we have two options to slide. If we look at this card, captures, no good, uh, match, captures, captures. So we've so far gotten two slides and one match. Captures, captures, match, that's two match, we're up to three slide. Capture, capture, four slide, five slide, six slide, three match, capture, capture. So in our hand, just using this as a sample hand, we have six ways to slide and three ways to match. Uh, one of them is a match capture, one of them is a match non-capture, we haven't talked about that. Uh, we haven't talked about that difference either. We may discuss that. My guess is, of course, that capturing is the weaker way to do it because we don't actually want five to flip. My guess is that these are better ways to match, but we will compare those later. I do want to you know, try to go through it seriously. But if we use this as an example, and it's just one example, but I bet, I bet it's something in that range, we have twice as many ways to slide around their starter as we do to match it. And maybe, maybe actually the average rate is even higher. I'm, I, I really don't know. Let's for now take as an assumption, it's something around two to one. We have twice as many moves that slide as we do that match. So if we play twice as many moves that slide as we do moves that match, that's really saying we're evaluating them as about equal. So if you play a lot more moves that slide than moves that match, that doesn't actually mean you prefer them it might just be that you have much higher availability on them. Which is to say, if you play as many moves that match as you play moves that slide, or more moves that match as, than you do slides, you almost certainly much prefer matching to sliding. So with that adjustment in mind, with the fact that to prefer sliding, you have to be playing it at, say, at least a two-to-one rate over matching, I'm curious if players think they slide or match more, and which they think is preferable. Um, it might depend a bit on level, but most closed games are played on level 10, so I'm comfortable just kind of drawing conclusions around level 10. I don't know. I, I, again, I, I'm a big corner guy when it comes to meeting centered starters, so I don't... And I'm not a person who plays a lot of closed, and when I do play closed, it's often closed non-combo, because I, I find that a really fun game. So I'm by no means claiming to be an expert here. I've never played much closed trade. I'm not. I, I think I'm good at this, but I, I don't. And like, I, I have had good results in TTAC, but that's hand-based, and that has some different things going on that I think favor me. But yeah, I, I'm curious what other people think on matching versus sliding. And it's easy to think, okay, which do I do more? And most of us will slide more, but sliding is way more available. So if it's at all close, you probably prefer matching. But if you say slide at a three to one rate versus matching, or you always slide, then you definitely prefer sliding. But if it's close or you match more than you slide, you definitely prefer matching. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. We'll, we'll be looking more into it. I think both are definitely better than capturing. Despite capturing doing pretty well in these example games, I think it's largely that the first turn player's hand doesn't come together very often and doesn't come together against the second turn player's hand. Which is not to say the second turn player's hand is all that good, right? You look at it in a vacuum, you go, eh. It just happened to line up in a lot of these examples. And first turn still scored quite well. Which is to say, I do not think capturing these starters is all that prominent. And I think in all the lines we looked at, as you get further into the game you went, both from both players' perspective, I wish five was the other person's control. And that is just telling, why are we flipping it so early?
even without empirically counting up all the results, I'm doing. I'm going to keep calling these videos empirical closed analysis, but I'm really doing a terrible job of being empirical because I'm not keeping any track of the data. But I think we can learn. You, I was reading something about polling where there was some paper where someone argued that polling aggregation is just not that useful if you look at the binary of who won, that it wasn't doing that much better than random picking. And there were a lot of problems with this analysis. One was it was only taking very recent American elections and only presidential, where, yeah, that's fairly true, but all the recent presidential elections have been fairly close, with the exception of kind of 2008 and 12, I guess. Um, so I guess only two elections since then. But they were taking a sample, like 2000 was obviously very close, 2004 was quite close, where there have been a lot of really close elections. And when there was a large margin one way, the Electoral College favored the other way. So it, it's been a bunch of close elections, is what I'm saying. And so like, if you go back further than that, suddenly the models really outperform coin flipping on a, on a binary who won model. But we shouldn't just consider the binary model. We have other information. And one of those bits of information was every time we were further in the game, we were thinking, I wish five was the other person's control, or yes, five is the other person's control, I have a chance to slide. And similarly, there is other information in elections. There is margin of victory. We have other electoral races. Uh, you might say those aren't that related to the presidency, but a lot of the poll aggregation is using similar models for uh, down ballot races and just making some adjustments for type of errors made uh, kind of collectively at the presidential level. So my point isn't that this is a great analogy. My analogies are bad and it's late. You saw a half hour ago or whatever my uh, go to sleep thing come on. But it's to say we have some binary results like win tie or loss but you can also pick up information as you go from other things that can be connected to win tie loss, like margin of victory can be a telling thing. But we can also have learned on the way, and the sharper we are, hopefully the more we pick up. We just should try not to hold those results too strongly because data is really powerful. You saw this a lot with sports prediction. If you had like people, as, as people started applying kind of sabermetric stuff to sports, and specifically to sports where it took longer to get to, like baseball got that stuff early, but other sports took a long time to get it, where you saw people who have you know, studied the sport for a long time, have a lot of expertise in the sport, and people who are good at numbers. And the people who come in who are good at numbers start predicting, and suddenly their predictions and their player evaluations that, that give those predictions are just way better than what the people with expertise think. Just way better, just very obviously people with numerical models that we now know to be fairly bad were just massively outperforming the experts in the area. The reason experts in the area have better picks now is because various models are so prevalent, it's impossible not to see a lot of their outputs and to be somewhat influenced by them. But what you do also find is if you put experts in the right range, right, it's so easy if you don't have the data to be orders of magnitude wrong about uh, but if you do have data putting you in a general sphere, you can go from, okay, I know the general area this is, and my expertise leans me this direction within that, you can be really valuable. It's not to say like numbers with no knowledge beat expertise. And with the early sabermetrics guys coming in, you got a bunch of people going, well, I did this regression model and it output this. And the people with expertise in the field were like, well, that's really stupid. That can't be right. And the person said, well, my model adds up better and is better predictively than what you're doing. And it was, but also it was really stupid about those things. So the numbers people can come in and have these really valuable, important insights and can really do a much better job of identifying the range of value a player can have, can plausibly have way better than the previous people. But they can also like 538, a site known for kind of political stuff, but also does a bunch of sports stuff had this incredibly stupid article where they ran a regression and control for way too, uh, just really stupidly applied regression. But like really well-paid companies like McKinsey apply incredibly stupid regression models and get paid enormous amounts of money, uh, basically reliably to tell companies to just fire people. Horrible company, McKinsey is terrible. 
but they just apply these really stupid regressions. They don't know anything. And so what happened at 538 is they applied this really stupid regression, and they came out with a steal in basketball is worth nine points of value. This is ridiculous. This is insane. In a possession, you cannot get more than four points, basically. I guess with technicals, you could get more. But the most you can get from a normal possession is hit a three and be fouled. Um, now, if you assumed the opponent was guaranteed to hit a three and be fouled and hit the free throw and get four points, and your steal guaranteed you would get a three and hit the free throw and get four points, that's still only an eight-point swing, and that is insane to think is the average outcome of a steal, right? It's impossible for basketball to add up to this being worth nine points. It's an absurd thing to conclude, and it's because if you stupidly apply regression, you get stupid results. Here's an example that's a little easier to follow. In baseball, if you take the number of runs a team scores and you say, okay, what I want to figure out is how valuable are singles, doubles, triples, walks, and home runs. I said that in a weird order. Walks, singles, doubles, triples, and home runs. How valuable are they each for how many runs my team scored? And so you take every team in the league and you run a regression that has five inputs, walks, singles, doubles, triples, home runs, and you have one output, total number of runs the team scored. And you ask it to a regression to come up with the model that best predicts how many runs the team will score. Actually, let's do it simpler. You do them one at a time. So you do singles, and you see what model from the number of singles each team hit uh, best predicts how many runs the team got total. You say, okay, that's the value of a single. Now we'll do it with doubles. Now we'll do it with triples. Now we'll do it with home runs. Now we'll do it with walks. Okay, we figured out how much each was worth. Now, you should all put them all in at the same time. There's lots of problems with doing it this way. But one of the funny things that will come out is you will get that teams that hit more triples are worse at offense. And if you're an idiot, you would conclude triples are bad. Now, triples are a great result in baseball. Any result where your player gets on base is a good result. Any result where they get out is a bad result. Triples are the second best result. It gets them the second furthest on the base path. It advances other runners the most. It guarantees all of them will score. Triples are fantastic. And yet you will conclude, if you're an idiot who applies numbers stupidly, that triples are a bad thing for the team. Why is this? Well, teams that hit, hit a lot of triples tend to be very fast and have low power. High amounts of triples tends to correlate with low amounts of home runs. And there's probably some other stuff going on, but I think that's the main one. And so if you don't control for anything and you just look at triples, you will see that the teams that hit more triples, this might be less true than it used to be. I haven't like rechecked this in the last, you know, 15, 20 years, but it certainly was true in like the 90s and 2000s and probably still true. But teams that hit a lot of triples tend to be speedy teams that don't have power. And it turns out power is worth more than speed. So yes, teams that hit a lot of triples do have worse offenses. You cannot conclude from that that triples are bad. So lots of ways to use the numbers badly. And what you found was the people who came in and were like, I'm good at numbers, did out predict the people who had sports expertise. But they came up with some absolutely stupid conclusions that people with sports expertise did point to and go, that's really dumb. And those people were correct. And by far the best work is done by people who love the sport or love whatever you're studying, have expertise in it, and have statistical stuff. So what I want to say for a triple triad here is it's really, it's, it's useful to have data. What I really should be doing is counting up all the outcomes we're getting, doing it in a somewhat rigorous way where we can really say, okay, the data does point to this, or these numbers are close and the sample's too small to say something, but these numbers are far enough away that the sample is telling us something and this is real evidence of something. And I'm not doing a good job of that. But we can also apply expertise along the way. So even though we're not getting that much data, we can draw conclusions like, hey, this end game would be a lot easier to play if five wasn't mine. Maybe I don't want five to be mine. And so even without that much data, we can, we can try to think in a useful way that applies our expertise, knows we can't take those results too strongly without data, that we could easily be swung way off by a small sample or one inclination or explanation, but also that 
we can figure out more things. All right, I'm really meandering, and I'm going to end the video. Hopefully, this was somewhat interesting. Next time, we move on to matching sides and sliding sides and try to think, is one of these options preferable, and how, are, how do they work?